It's my privilege to introduce today's MC that I referenced earlier and our Q&A moderator. Christopher Callahan is the founding dean of the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University. He is also vice provost of the ASU downtown Phoenix campus and the CEO of Arizona PBS, the nation's seventh largest PBS station. Please join me in welcoming our MC, Dean Christopher Callahan. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for your outstanding work at the Sandra Day O'Connor Institute. Like Justice O'Connor, the O'Connor Institute is a true Arizona treasure. It is a great honor for me to introduce today's very special O'Connor Institute guest. In an extraordinary career spanning five decades, Leslie Stahl of CBS News has been one of America's most accomplished and honored journalists. A fearless reporter, probing interviewer, and compelling storyteller, Ms. Stahl has forged a reputation of integrity and excellence that serves as a role model for others in our industry, from hardened news veterans to aspiring journalists at places like the Cronkite School. And today, at a time when Ms. Stahl's brand of accurate, honest, relentless, in-depth, and fact-based journalism is needed now more than ever, she continues to be a shining light for our news industry and for our country. A Massachusetts native and graduate of Wheaton College, Ms. Stahl began her broadcast journalism career at a local TV station as a producer and reporter at her hometown, hometown station, WHDH-TV, in Boston. In 1972, she burst on the national scene as a young reporter for CBS News, and over the next 45 years, went on to cover and often break some of the most important stories of the day. Her trademark tenacity was on, the, was on full display from the very beginning when she was assigned to cover the Watergate scandal for the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. She later became one of the few women at the time to ascend to the prestigious White House beat, covering the presidencies of Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush. Ms. Stahl served as the moderator of the iconic Sunday morning CBS public affairs program Face the Nation from 1983 to 1991. And she also hosted the news magazine 48 Hours Investigates. But Ms. Stahl is perhaps best known for the extraordinary work as a correspondent for 60 Minutes, the hard-hitting CBS news magazine and the most successful program in the history of television, now in its 49th year. During her 26 years of 60 Minutes, Ms. Stahl has interviewed heads of state reported from war-torn countries around the world, covered political intrigue from the nation's capital, and gave voice to the voiceless through moving, in-depth reports. Ms. Stahl's journalism has been honored with virtually every award in the broadcasting industry. She has won 12 prestigious Emmy Awards, her first in 1983 for covering a Beirut bombing, and her most recent, just last year, for a report on how police recruit young confidential informants. Her ability to gain unprecedented access to the Guantanamo Bay prison facilities led to a special two-part series and an Edward R. Murrow Award. Her story on the plight of Iraqi children under Saddam Hussein earned her the coveted Alfred I. DuPont Silver Baton. A report on the Michigan militia won the RTNDA Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. And her Middle East reports in 2010 were honored by the Overseas Press Club for best interpretation of international affairs. Ms. Stahl's career has been recognized with a Lifetime Achievement Emmy and the Paul White Award for Lifetime Achievement. The recipient of honorary degrees from Colgate University and Loyola College, Ms. Stahl also is the author of two books. Her powerful 1999 book, Reporting Live, detailed her experiences covering Washington for more than 20 years, from the Watergate affair to the 1991 Gulf War. And her latest bestseller is Becoming Grandma, 
the joys and science of new grandparenting. It is a great honor that Ms. Stahl is able to take time from her very, very busy schedule to be with us today. Please join me in welcoming Leslie Stahl of CBS News. Introduction. Oh my goodness. Have I been around that long? <laughs> no wonder I'm a grandmother. I've been around that long. Hi everyone. Before I start talking about what I found out about us grandmothers, how many of you are grandmothers? Oh my people. Yes. You're gonna know, you're gonna be shaking your head if because I know you feel about your grandchildren the way I feel about mine. But I do have to tell you that just the other day, uh, on April 4th, I know it was April 4th because that was the publication date of this book, paperback, I walked out of a coffee shop in New York and I was really feeling good and then there was a sign. There was a bent over little old man and he had tufts of white hair and he was pushing a little stroller, and the little kid in the stroller was acting up, and he was being so gentle with them. And my, I, n I never talk to strangers, ever. You know, I'm, a, I'm like a little kid, don't talk to strangers. I blurted out, Grandpa. And he looked at me and he said, Daddy. So if there are any grandfathers here today, I will not be referring to you as grandpa. Never going there again. So I don't know about you all, but I wanted to be a grandmother from the age of 40. And my kid was five. I just knew, I knew somehow that it was gonna be like a rocket ride of wonderful feelings and emotions. And when my first granddaughter was born, I, I really did go into some kind of a tr transcendental, I don't know, trip out of body, in body. I had such a, a feeling of euphoria when I held her and Part of the reason I wanted to write this book was to find out what that physicality, what that, that wonderful happiness that grandmothers feel all over their body when they hug their grandchildren. Uh, well, first I wanted to find out if I was unique, and I found out that I am not, that this is pretty universal. The first thing I did when I agreed to write the book was interview a bio neurobiologist. And she told me that the brain pathways for grandchild love, in other words, what happens when we hold our grandchildren, that pathway is the identical pathway for romantic love. So I discovered that what's going on with us and our grandchildren is that we actually, literally, truly fall madly in love. We do, and that, when I heard that, it all, it all made sense to me. Now I know that it is a physical feeling and it's absolutely running through my whole body. We are infused with a hormone called oxytocin and it is called the bonding hormone, and it does create euphoria, and it binds us to them. And you know, I thought, well, maybe it's because I'm seeing my baby be a mother, or I'm seeing my child who I raised be a wonderful parent, and that must be all mixed in with it. And then I thought, well, maybe it's Maybe it's the idea that the seed is being passed on. 
It's all those things. And it is just the most glorious feeling you can have. And we all have a new purpose when we become a grandparent. Something else happens to grandmothers, and this also happens to grandfathers. Somehow, and this is physiological as well, because somehow, and no one's been able to identify why, but somehow, in the presence of our grandchildren, our ability to say the word no is disabled. <laughs> and no matter how strict we were as parents, we turn into mush balls. We become permissive and indulgent, and our children look at us and say, what happened to mom? I mean, we buy them whatever they want. We know we're not supposed to give them candy. Hello. We know we're not supposed to cross their parents. We know that we walk around biting our tongues so we don't antagonize because we want to hold those babies. And you know what? Having done a lot of research on this book, my advice is don't say anything. If they tell you there's a new rule, you'll say, fine, I'm with the program. New rule is fine with me, whatever you want, just as long as I can hold my baby. Grandmothers today, I call it the new grandparenting. Grandmothers today um, are unlike grandmothers ever before. Uh, first of all, um, we're really not grandmothers, and I put this, you know, in quotes. We do not have tightly permed white hair. We are all blonde. It's number one. We jog. We're seeing patients. We're lawyers. We're running for president. And our families don't look like families. If you go to Grandparents' Day at your average kindergarten, several of the kids show up with eight people, <laughs> including two sets who don't talk to each other. <laughs> Grandpa Herman arrives with his new partner, Joe. <laughs> and Grandma used to be Grandpa. There's, there's two wonderful things that are happening to bring us into the, our, our grandchildren's lives. If you don't live in the same city, uh, thank goodness for Skype. I don't live in the same city as my grandchildren, and I, I FaceTime with them as often as possible. The idea of not being in their lives is unbearable, and so this allows us to, even if we're not nearby, it's the only thing about the internet I like. The only thing. But I really like it. Something else is going on, and that is a huge trend in the United States where grandparents, when they retire, are selling the houses that they've lived in for 40, 50 years, and they're moving to be near their grandchildren. And what's interesting uh, that is unlike our generation is that the kids really want us there. I'm not sure they want us there, they need us there uh, because, th because of the economy. Um, our kids uh, cannot afford childcare for the most part, which is hideously expensive. In some cities around the United States, it costs as much as college, daycare. And, uh, and our government, as we know, doesn't do anything to help, although I guess President Trump is proposing some help for that. Uh, and our children uh, need us financially. And today, believe this, uh, it's a stunning statistic I came upon, even though I already knew it from myself, but grandparents today are spending seven times more on their grandchildren than grandparents did just 10 years ago. Think about that. I can't tell you how many people I interviewed, grandparents, and they would say, don't use my name, 
but we bought the house. Or, you know, don't, don't ever use my name, but we pay for the nanny. Uh, grandparents today, because of a change in the tax laws, can in fact pay for education and pay for medical care, and there's no tax liability. It's, it's not considered a gift if it's a grandparent to taking care of a grandchild. And so we're stepping up because our children need us to. Uh, here's something that uh, I, I found which I think explains our craving for our grandchildren. There are only three animals on the planet who have grandmothers. When in the animal kingdom, you, a person, a, a female, can no longer reproduce, she dies. It's, you know, the survival of the fittest. If she lives, she's just taking money, uh, uh, taking food from the rest of the family, food, and so she dies. Uh, there are only three animals that, where grandmothers live past menopause or whatever. I don't know if the other animals that uh, have grandmothers have menopause, but they have grandmothers. One is whales and dolphins and elephants and us. And for years, for, for maybe hundreds of years, anthropologists were trying to figure out why in the, in the sort of survival of the fittest notion, grandmothers exist for humans. And I'm gonna tell you why, and you're gonna laugh, but it's not a joke. We are here to babysit. <laughs> in the caveman time, both parents went out, both parents hunted, and grandma stayed back, and she foraged around the cave, but she, she raised the children. And grandma back then even wet nursed the children, because mama was out getting the food. And that persisted through agricultural, the agricultural world, and today there are many societies where that's still true, where grandma stays home and raises the kids. Uh, and, and in India and parts of China, the young mother is the scullery maid, and grandma does all the raising of the children. Uh, but I think that we crave our grandchildren because we're, we're really meant to be in there. We're, we're physically, genetically, and we crave them in a real honest way because we're meant to be there. Now, I know that even though our children need us, when we are involved, uh, I knew it by instinct, but m uh, many people also know it by instinct, but many don't, and we talked about it two seconds ago, is you can't say anything, not a peep. I mean, when I say not a peep, I mean like no, no shoulder movement. <laughs> they can read our body language. I mean, they know when we don't approve. We, they know. What do you mean you're giving them bologna for lunch? What? It's not, you don't say that. You just say, oh, bologna. Oh, nice. <laughs> there is, um, I found this out too, that there is almost not, the, now you're gonna say, oh, I get along with my daughter-in-law, just great. But there's a hardwired uh, antagonism between uh, mothers and daughters-in-law. It just is. Uh, no one knows, well, I say no one knows why, it's hardwired. It apparently, anthropologists say that young mothers want the husband to focus on the new nest and not the old nest. And a lot of daughters-in-law don't even know what they're, why there's kind of pushing the other family away. But all these things come down to us through our, through our, uh, through our genes. We, we're all doing things we're out of control of, and that relationship is one of them. And even when it's your own kid, when it's your own daughter, I'm the maternal grandmother. I walk on eggshells. I really do. My, I don't, one of the new things that the young kids today do is um, sleep training. 
Are you all familiar with sleep training? We didn't do it. This is, you know, where they let the kid cry forever and ever till they learn to sleep the night. I just happened to be there that day, the first day of sleep training. I was, they said, uh, they put us, my husband and me, in the living room with the monitor. So you're sitting there hearing, and they go in, this child is what, six weeks, seven weeks old? You know, little maybe, I don't remember. What, I mean, she can't, she doesn't understand any, she's a blob. And they're reading her a book, and they're singing to her, and they're telling her how much they love her, and then they put the humidifier on, so there'll be a hum, and they close the door. And then she cries, I'm, I'm pointing because it's the monitor, she's screaming forever and ever. And, that, it, and they look at their watch, and in 10 minutes they can go back in and say, we, I, we love you, honey, close the door again. And I'm, my skin is coming off, I'm, I'm really, can't, I can't stand it, I can't stand it. But do I say anything I do not? Not a peep? The idea that I would express my outrage at this ridiculousness would never come. And I knew about body language. I mean, we can be critical without saying it, you know, we can just do it. So my husband and I couldn't stand it anymore. We left early, we were staying at a hotel. And he said to me when we got in the car, he said, you know what they're saying? I said, what? He said, they're saying, thank God they left early. <laughs> I said, why? I said, I didn't say a word. I said, I, I, I held on to the sides of the chair, so my, <laughs> didn't say anything. And he said to me, you didn't say anything? Are you kidding me? You didn't shut up for one second. So what did I do? He said, three times you said, we didn't do that with you and you turned out okay. <laughs> and five times he said, I said, I'm going in there and I'm picking her up. So I swear I didn't say anything. I didn't hear myself. I didn't hear myself. That's how, that's how vigilant we have to be. We don't, we are so confused by what they're doing that, you know, I've had pe women say, you know, if they're doing it wrong, don't we have to say something? I mean, we have to if they, no, we don't. No, we don't. Because we just want these babies. I came upon something that truly shocked me um, and pained me, and that is a huge number of grandparents who are not allowed to see their own grandchildren. It, it, this is such a huge problem that there is an organization called Alienated Grandparents Anonymous, and they have chapters all over the United States. And it's anonymous because the grandparents are kind of ashamed to tell anybody because they think people are going to say, well, what did they do wrong? And the truth is they didn't do anything wrong. Uh, I have a very close friend who finally confessed this to me. It's the first time I knew that this was an issue. But it is an issue. And the most heartbreaking, the, the single most heartbreaking, believe this, the grandparents of 9-11 had children killed in 9-11, and they are not allowed to see their grandchildren, and a, and a substantial number of them. Can you believe that? So this is, this is uh, not, not an insignificant issue and problem that grandparents have, and that's why I joke, but I mean it. Not a word, not a single word. Uh, I wanna go back for a second on how much money we're spending on our grandchildren. Have I already spoken for 15 minutes? I could go on, you know, or I keep going. So grandparents uh, are not only helping with medical bills, uh, paying for the nanny, whatever. But we're buying big ticket items. We're buying the crib, we're buying the carriages. Um, I know my husband and I uh, 
turned one of the rooms in our apartment, because we don't live anywhere near them, hoping they'll come, we turned one of the rooms into a, into a nursery. And we bought a crib and the whole thing. We, out, we outfitted a complete nursery. And I then discovered that lots and lots of grandparents do this. This is kind of what we do now. And so there are now grandmother showers. <laughs> really? Honestly? I mean, how else, how else are we going to get our sippy cups? <laughs> Brides get Cuisinarts. We get snot suckers. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Someone said there are three stages of life. In the first stage, we believe in Santa Claus. In the second stage, we don't believe in Santa Claus. And in the third stage, we are Santa Claus. <laughs> That's us. <laughs> All right, where am I? Okay. Eggshells. Uh, you know, I'm just floating along here. Um, okay. Um, one of the benefits, great benefits, of being a grandparent is that these little kids are therapeutic. And this has been documented. When we are involved in our grandchildren's lives, we, we truly get healthier. My own husband, and I'd like to tell you briefly about him for a minute, my own husband was in a deep depression, and so was uh, Bob Simon, my colleague. We had our, our grandchildren at the same time. Both men popped out of their depressions when their grandchildren were born and held them. So I say I had this wonderful, warm, gushy, mushy feeling all over me. And these two men had their depressions lifted and never came back. My husband has Parkinson's disease. And I've been speaking a lot because I'm on a book tour uh, to audiences much like you, although not as beautiful as you are. <laughs> and uh, I've been telling them about it because I think at our age, we inevitably are going to have friends, spouses. We're going to know people who have Parkinson's. And my husband has done two things that have helped. One is he boxes. And boxing, there's a whole new program. It's basically bo boxing for Parkinson's, and it's spreading all over the country. I'm sure there's a program here. It just, it, it helps with every one of the, almost every one of the symptoms of Parkinson's, and it's designed for them. And if they have it, the program pushes them just a little further than they're able to go. It's just remarkable how helpful this is for people with Parkinson's. But the other thing, and this just happened in the last couple of months, He's had something called DBS, which is deep brain stimulation. It's a brain operation. And they implant uh, wires in the brain, one on each side, and a, a battery is implanted like a pacemaker. And when they, my husband had a tremor at that point when he's got the operation that was so bad it was really a flap. And he couldn't button his own shirts anymore. He couldn't write anymore. Uh, he really had trouble even eating. He uh, really, he, I'm a very slow walker. He, he was walking half as fast as I was. And he had a mask on his face, a Parkinsonian mask. So they turned the electricity on. His tremor is gone. I'm telling you, his tremor is gone. He buttons his shirts, his handwriting came back. He's walking with me. I'm going to cry. And his mask is gone. So I tell you, because it's been a miracle for us, everybody with Parkinson's is not eligible for this operation. You have to be tested, and you have to, they have to know it's going to help you before they'll give it to you. And there's many different kinds of Parkinson's. So it doesn't help everybody, and, and everybody uh, who has Parkinson's uh, 
is not necessarily uh, fit to have the operation, but it's worth looking into because the difference in the quality of life is dramatic. It doesn't change the course of the disease itself, but the quality of life with that particular disease is huge. So, um, I'm going to take some questions from my friend Christopher. I do want to say I am so thrilled that this lunch uh, is going to help the Children's Hospital. I think that's so appropriate for me and for you, and it makes you feel good. And I am honored to be here for the O'Connor Institute as well. Uh, it's just been fabulous, and I can tell you're a great audience. Uh, and I hope that if you ask me questions, you're going to be kind because I'm a little old grandmother and you don't want to say anything <laughs> devastating. Thank you. I also, I also want to say one more thing. I want to say one more thing, um, Christopher. At the very end, save a little time because I've come with a joke, <laughs> a grandpa joke. <laughs> okay. This is the part I don't like when I'm interviewed. <laughs> Do you want to open with the joke, or should we <laughs> no, uh, we'll close? close with the joke. <laughs> I want them to leave well. Okay. okay. <sighs> Leslie, actually, we're going to start off. This is from uh, our audience members. This is actually not a, uh, a question, but just a statement. I thought it was very appropriate. Where's table 40? It's table 40. Table 40 in the, in the back. So, Leslie, yes. on behalf of table 40, thank you for pioneering and championing women at a time when so few female mo role models existed. We will be watching you shine on 60 Minutes. The questions, as you can imagine, are all across the board, so we will, Go we will, we will be jumping, jumping all around. Um, did you have a mentor in your career, and if so, uh, what was the most important lesson from that person? I really didn't. And I think that women my age didn't have mentors. Uh, and, and the whole concept was kind of strange when, when I first learned that there were such things as mentors. Um, there, were, there were no role models for me when I came into the business. You know, what I say in the book is that my generation, we were the, and they call us this, I, th I think it's kind of funny to, to say it myself, but we're called the pioneers because we were the first wave into the, into the professional workforce. And now I say we're pioneers again because we're pioneering the new grandparenting. And we are different kinds of grandmothers than ever before, partly because of technology, but partly because we're healthy. And we actually are older than our grandmothers were, because they got married earlier and their children had children earlier. So we're actually older, but we're, we're healthier and we have more energy. So we're pioneers uh, at, at what we're doing again. More and more, grandparents are becoming the main caretakers for children. How could the U.S. help reverse that trend and uh, re-engage well, is that something that you found in your research for the book? I found, uh, I, I, I talk about uh, a whole chapter on grandparents who are raising the grandchildren, and many of whom actually gain legal custody. And when you say, stop it, you know, it, there's never a good reason for a grandparent to be raising a child. You think of why that happened. Uh, in most of the cases, the little kid was abused or probably more likely neglected, maybe because of drugs. Uh, some of the grandchil grandchildren uh, are being raised by their grandparents because their parents went to Afghanistan or Iraq and didn't come back. Uh, so the reasons are not good. Thank goodness there are grandparents who are healthy enough uh, to be able to, to save these children. Uh, and I, I salute them. My sister-in-law is a child psychologist, and she says these grandparents are heroes. Some of them go into this with great joy, because it's a, it's a new lease on their life, 
and they love these little kids so much, they're thrilled to do it, but a lot resent it. Here they were, just about to retire, go on a cruise or whatever the great plan was, and uh, they're angry at their daughter or son for doing this to them, but eventually they come around to loving the kids so much that they do, and not all of them, but a lot of them do gain a, a great deal of pleasure and joy, and they have a new purpose in life, which we all know is really important. But it's a big problem in the country. Uh, grandparents <clears throat> get tired earlier, you know. <laughs> we do, and it, it's a burden. In New York City, there's a building that I call the, grand, the grandmother building. The city built it, and they really take care of these older women who are raising little kids. Sometimes they're the great grandmothers raising the kids. Really? Yeah. 80 years old with a little infant. I know. As a grandmother, what are the challenges you see for our grandkids, and what will they be facing uh, that you didn't see when you started your career? What? What? Are I'm the, sorry. Can we? Um, what are the challenge? Can you hear us now? If I really speak up? Okay. Move your mic way up. What are the challenges facing our grandchildren? And I have to say, I am obsessed, worrying about the world we're going to leave our kids and particularly our grandchildren. I mean, I, I don't even know where to start. The environment is one place, but they are not earning as much money as we did. There aren't enough jobs. And that's only going to get worse. Uh, and it's because of automation and robots and the direction that life is heading. The, our society doesn't discuss how we're going to be structured when there aren't enough jobs. We never even talk about it. We don't think about it. I mean, this is being contemplated in the, in the most precious you know, academic institutions. But society doesn't think about what life will be when maybe a tenth of us have employment that, that is what we would consider a living wage. Everything's going to have to be reorganized. And not only that, we're all going to live to 100. And maybe in the, our grandchildren will live to 110 or 120. So what do you do with all those added years? We're, no one plans for them. No one has thought through, for us even. You know you're going to live a third of your life after you retire. One third of your life. And I can't tell you how many people have no idea what they're going to do with that time. And I write in the book, taking care of your grandchild or some other little kid is the perfect answer, because it's the next generation. I mean, this business of reorganizing society, that's probably going to be something that happens incrementally, and our grandchildren are going to be the ones who are going to have to go through that transition. I don't want to be dark. I'm going to end on a joke, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and I also worry about technology and what the internet is doing to the brains of our babies. Um, rewiring their brains completely, how they learn, how they'll have friendships, what romance will be like, all those things. And you can't, you, you can't stop it. You know, the internet is in charge of us. The internet runs our lives. How did that happen? And can we get back in control? Can we, can we start driving this train? Can we? And if so, how? Stop and think about these things. It's terrifying. Let's tell a joke. But, but it's actually, stay, staying on that topic, which is interesting, so what is your biggest concern about the internet? Um, um, first of all, Justice O'Connor, is that, is that better? I'm checking with the boss. <laughs> we adjusted. Good. Um, what's your biggest concern with the internet? Is it the isolation that you feel that uh, people, especially young people, are, uh, are experiencing? It's very much the isolation. It's that the nature of friendships, even our friendships. 
We don't have to wait to see what it's done to friendship. I mean, I, I don't talk to my girlfriends on the phone anymore. We write, and, and the trick is to see how short our email can be. <laughs> uh, but I, I worry that the internet is changing everything. It's changing our politics, journalism. I worry about that a lot. And uh, that's absolutely everything. Uh, it's going to continue to. It's changing books. All the things I care about, you know, changing. Am I an old fuddy-duddy, you know, <laughs> to, to be so concerned about this? Maybe when, when the automobile came along, somebody was talking to a group and saying, oh my god, what's the car going to do to us? Uh, maybe I'm there, but I am, and I worry about it. I know we all worry about the world we're leaving our grandchildren. We, ha we do, all of us. Are you personally on any of the social media channels? Um, I'm, I'm not very diligent about it, to, to be honest yeah. with you. I, I don't like any of it. <laughs> and to sell it. Okay, I'm saying that the, the social media uh, is something that if you're selling a book as I am, you better be do, diligent about, and I'm not. And I want to sell a book, so that's how bad I think it is. <laughs> My little war against all of this. Uh, let's, let's change topics a little bit. Um, there's a number of questions, as you can imagine, about um, what's going on in the country today, with politics, uh, particularly in Washington. You have a unique view, having covered a number of different administrations. Um, what is your, and this is not about the ideology, because everybody knows that journalists don't talk about their personal ideologies. Uh, I actually uh, had uh, my re removed That's my <laughs> opinion. They were taken out. <laughs> But, but how would you, using uh, the context of covering uh, the different White Houses that you have over time, uh, compared to the Trump administration, what do you see going on, um, and what concerns do you have, both in terms of the country, and in particular, that relationship between our industry, uh, the news media, and the government? Um. I, I, I'm trying not to give my opinion. It's going to be hard. Uh, it just seems that, that uh, there's, there's so much coming at us now with this administration. Every day, five things. Not one thing or one thing a week. It's five new things every day. Uh, I don't know if it's a deliberate tactic to distract us or if it's just the nature of today when things our, have been accelerated. Communication is accelerated. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't know why, but things seem to be uh, bombarding us, and bombarding the White House, bombarding the president. You know, I interviewed him three days after he won the election, and. Uh, Can you not hear me in the back? Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me now? Oh, wow. OK. Well, you missed all, everything I said about grandmothers. <laughs> and somehow, Christopher very, very skillfully got me onto Trump, <laughs> where I did not want to go. But I will tell you about the interview. Um, as I said, it was three days after the election. Uh, for, but let me go back a step. I had interviewed him the day he named Pence as his running mate. And when that interview ended, he said, I'm going to give you my first interview when I'm elected. And I said, oh, that's nice, knowing that Hillary was going to be elected. <laughs> <laughs> Who didn't know that, right? So I told him that was great, and thank you. And, boop. and then he got elected. And no one thought, saw that coming. And he said, I'm, I'm giving Leslie Stahl the first interview. So he was up to his word. So that's how I got the interview. Um, in the first one with Pence, he was kind of leaning forward, um, ready for combat, re ready to pounce, uh, kind of the person we were seeing on the campaign trail. But three days after he won the election, uh, he walked in, uh, I don't want to say somber, but he, he, uh, he was much more thoughtful, 
Uh, he was leaning back, not leaning in. Uh, he was not attacking at all. If he didn't like the question, he answered it. Uh, you, you know, trying to think it through. Uh, to me, it was clear that he did not think he was going to win this election, and the idea of the weight of what he was about to take on was just washing over him. And he was kind of in a bit of shock. Now, that's how I read it. I did ask him, I said, now, you, you didn't think you were going to win this election, right? He said, no, no, I knew it all along. Uh, but I'm telling you, what we saw was a man who uh, was just beginning to deal with it. And frankly, he came off, if you remember this interview, he came off as presidential. And I thought, and our whole team thought, okay, he has turned the page. He even said he wasn't going to tweet that much in the interview. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, he's, this man is going to be our president, and he's going to think in those terms. And I've will tell you, I was really, really surprised with a couple of days after that interview, he was back to the guy we saw on the campaign trail. So he's, he's a man of surprises, as we already know. Um, but what I t said before that you didn't hear, I think, is that uh, when I joined 60 Minutes, I had my opinions surgically removed, and they are just not there. So I'm not going to tell you what I think about everything that's going on. Because I'd be, you know, out of business. <laughs> Staying on the interviewing theme, uh, so Leslie is known as, as, as with, with, even within journalism circles, as a fantastic interviewer. Uh, the Trump interview being a great example, which we actually used uh, as a case study at the Cronkite School. Um, really? And there's a, uh, we did. Oh, I yes. want to come and see that. Um, <laughs> and there, there's a number of, uh, of questions about interviewing. So if I could just, uh, I'll, I'll toss out a couple of them. Um, uh, if you could tell us about your most interesting or unexpected interview and the most inspiring person you In interviewed. Inspiring? Inspiring. Okay. If you can hear me, say so. And I'll just put this as you know, close <laughs> as I can. Um, the, well, an inspiring interview. Before I got to 60 Minutes, as you said, Christopher, I was covering Washington and presidents. And we were not allowed to give any hint of our, uh, whether we approved or disapproved, liked, disliked, to give that away would be, you know, an infraction. We'd go to jail or something. Uh, that, was, that was the way I was trained. And there was a sense that every story had to be fair, meaning, Two sides had to be presented, and that's what we call mainline journalism. We still do that at 60 Minutes. Uh, but one of the first stories I did, this is the inspiration question, uh, was a profile of a, a man who was considered the best brain surgeon in the country. He was at Mayo Clinic. His name was Thorvald Sunt, and he had bone cancer and was in excruciating, unbelievable pain, except when he operated. And that was one of the reasons we went to do the story, sort of mind over matter, or the adrenaline flows, or whatever. Um, I brought the piece back, and I said to the boss at that point, Don Hewitt, I said, I, I have this great story, but you're not going to run it. And he said, why? And I said, because I love this man, and it's, it shows in every frame. Uh, I just thought he was brilliant, and I had him with a little kid, and because Dr. Sunt was taking chemo, he was bald, and his little patient, little boy about six, was also bald because he was taking chemo. And Dr. Sunt got down on the floor with him, and he said, look, we look exactly alike. It was so kind and sweet. Oh, I love the man. So Hewitt said, you know something, Leslie? At 60 Minutes, there are certain kinds of stories where you're allowed to like. And I was born again. Uh, and so, I mean, it was inspiring in the sense that we can go out and do stories on people we admire and let the uh, public know that this is a person who belongs up here on a pedestal um, and not be told, 
you know, we can't, we can't have any opinions whatsoever. So I think when I got to 60 Minutes, I was freed. Uh, on the second question, I mean the first question, you know, who, who are the, the people I've met or interviewed who uh, have impressed me, whatever? It's never gonna be the, the official. It isn't gonna be the official. Their job in their minds is to not answer the question. And they're all the same. It doesn't matter what country, it doesn't matter what position in government. They know they have an obligation to be held accountable. But when they give big interviews, they're just trying to escape. They're not really trying to be accountable. And so the, the people who I do admire the most are what, you know, you might call, and I'm putting this in quotes, ordinary people who are doing something extraordinary. Um, parents who have disabled children and they're, it's really difficult. Uh, I, I've done some of those that just sit on my heart, you know. And those are the people I end up remembering more than the, the officials and although I've had a couple of officials storm out on me. That was fun. <laughs> but um, yeah, the ones I admire are not those people. And any any that, that come to mind that was particularly difficult? Margaret Thatcher. Because? Um, okay, so Margaret Thatcher may be the smartest person I interviewed. I've interviewed some really smart people. So she used to come over to, the, to Washington once a year um, to meet with the president. And of course, she was prime minister much longer than any of the presidents. So she came over many times with different presidents. Uh, this particular time was at the height of Iran-Contra. And remember, she was very close to Ronald Reagan. She came over to kind of buck him up and support him. And uh, every time she came, she gave one interview to one of the Sunday shows, and it was my turn, because I was doing Face the Nation. She came on and I said something like, can, you, can your government ever trust our government again? Because our government lied to your government about our selling arms to Iran. She said something like, well, ah, uh, two countries, and she kept putting her fingers together like that. Our two countries have a bond that can't be broken by something like this. Uh, we are going to be allies and friends through this and through many other hard hardships or whatever. So I asked it again. I said something like, well, can you personally trust Ronald Reagan? He lied to you. I got pretty much the same answer. Well, my dear, you have to know that our friendship is very strong and we, had, we respect each other and know nothing is going to change between us. Okay, can you believe I asked it a third time? <laughs> Don't know, I mean it's live television. So she snaps, she totally snaps. <laughs> she starts, uh, she turns into a nanny and I was a bad girl and she starts lecturing and then she, it was, it was terrible. I was a pool of blood on the floor. <laughs> she ends this tirade at me with the following. Why is it that I seem to love your country more than you do? So, <laughs> I thought, well, at, at least it's good television is what I really thought. <laughs> so she leaves. Furious, furious. Everyone around me said, she's just so angry. I said, you know something, she is such a professional and when she goes for the questions sessions in parliament, everybody yells at her. For her, this was a game. No, she was really mad. <laughs> but then she got, she'd been doing these interviews every year, once a year. She never got any mail. She got bales full of mail, and so did I. And her mail and my mail were pretty much the same. One million Margaret Thatcher, two stall. And it was my mother and my father. And, and because she got all this mail saying, you really told her and great for you, 
uh, she realized that she had helped Ronald Reagan and she ended up loving the interview. And I got a lovely, I wrote her a thank you note and she wrote back something like, cheer up. I mean, a very sweet note. <laughs> Leslie, we have several questions on uh, a term that I'm not terribly fond of, uh, this fake news idea. Um, so I think it's um, defined differently by different people. So let me, let me reframe it slightly. Okay, good. Do you have any concerns? We deal in journalism, our currency is fact. We deal with facts. Do you have any concerns that, uh, that we're having an erosion of, of fact-based conversations, uh, not just in the media, but in society at large? Well, this is one of the things that uh, I think technology has forced upon us. The idea that we are now ga getting our information from a medium where th there's no filter. Anything is out there. Everything is out there. Ridiculous rumors, conspiracy theories, Lies, also truth, but how can you tell one from the other? Uh, it's part of my outrage at this medium that, that has taken over our lives and we are completely unable to police. There's no journalistic policeman, there's, no, uh, there's nobody governing even if, if there's corruption on this medium. I mean, the hacking is unbelievable. It's all happening in the same space out there that is taking over. Uh, and I've already said this. But yeah, the fake news part of it is completely distressing. And not just because I'm a journalist, because I'm a citizen. How do you, if you go on, on the internet to gain your information, if you don't go to a completely reputable site that you trust, uh, how are you going to know that what you're reading is real? It's, it's, not a, it's not healthy. It's not healthy for society. And do you see it changing? Or do you, is this a short-term problem? Or is this something that's going to continue? You know, it, it, it's, it's like the Wild West. So how did they control the Wild West? Well, they came in with policemen. And it, it, it will eventually be policed but I don't know what's gonna happen to get us there. It's going to be a difficult, trying many years, but we have to gain control of it. And it is the Wild West. I mean, it's a shootout every day without, a, without the sheriff in town, or a very weak sheriff in town. Is it time for the joke? We have one more, one one more question. Time. Okay. And because it brings, it brings both, both dimensions of what we've been talking about today together. Uh, so, from one of our audience members, what would, what would you tell a granddaughter if she wants a career in television news? Will there be television news <laughs> when she gets to that point? Uh, I should be asking you that. Will there be television news in 20, 25 years? There will be news. And what platform it's on, I don't know. But I like to well, think there will be... Um, I think that, for me, it has been the most fulfilling, fun, exciting, brain-enriching uh, career I could ever have because of my personal interest. Um, and it's also, frankly, honestly, uh, been lucrative. I've been able to uh, raise enough money to live on. I don't know what's going to happen to our profession. And when it no longer provides a living wage, uh, the smartest kids in the class won't be attracted to it anymore, as they are now. And uh, I have to wait and see. I have to let the shakedown period shake a little more. I'm not sure I would advise her to go into it. I don't know. But you're, you're teaching kids today. I understand that young kids just love journalism today. Yeah. And the smartest kids are attracted to it still. Still. Am I right? Yes. And we hope that continues. I hope but that we continues. But we have the same concerns that you do. Yeah. And police are, police are the answer. That's frightening. <laughs> All right. <laughs>
Ready? <laughs> okay, it's a grandpa joke. I collected jokes when I was out doing my research, and I'm bringing you my very favorite. It's a grandpa joke. It's about Mel, Grandpa Mel. And his 80th birthday was coming up, and he was miserable. He did not want to turn the big 8-0, and he was bleeding all over his friends. He was driving his wife crazy. He did not want this birthday to come. And so his friends got together, and they said, you know, we have to do something really special for Mel on his birthday. So the day arrives, and there's a knock on Mel's door, and he answers, and standing there is this young, spectacularly beautiful, voluptuous, sexy girl, and she says, Mel? And he said, yes. She said, hi, I'm Susie, and your friend sent me to give you super sex. And Mel looks down, and he looks up, and he says, I'll take the soup. <laughs> a perfect way to end. Um, Leslie, we can't, cannot thank you enough for coming out to Arizona, for joining us today. On behalf of the O'Connor Institute and Justice O'Connor, uh, a token of oh, our lovely. appreciation. Thank you. And to thank everybody, you. Leslie you. Stahl.